Okay, welcome back. This is the uh, Chapter 11 lecture, um, right after Christmas in our class this year. Uh, first, we have, uh, and it's describing chemical reactions. So we have ch uh, Section 11.1, and we need to define a chemical reaction. A chemical reaction is the process in which the physical and chemical properties of the original substances change as new substances within different properties form. Uh, there are two parts to a chemical reaction. There are the, th the reactant side, which is the substance that enters the chemical reaction. Okay, and there's the product side, which is the substance produced in a chemical reaction. However, I want you to think of it like this and with reactions and products, and it's, it's this. Reactants react to produce products. Reactants react to produce products. And, okay, there you go, it's a bit cleaner. Uh, so reactants react to produce products. Reactants are the things that come together, and the products are the things that are produced. Okay, now, the reason for reactions. When the bonds of the reactants break, it requires or absorbs energy. If something absorbs energy, this is an endothermic process. When something absorbs energy, uh, when it, when the bonds of the products form, okay, it releases energy, and this is known as an exothermic reaction. Exothermic. Now, reactions occur when the bonds of the reactants break in order to produce new bonds for the products. Okay, so it's, you have to break some eggs in order to make your omelet. Okay, sorry about the silence there. Um, reactions occur when bonds of the reactions break to produce new bonds. So why does this occur? It occurs to lower the overall energy of the system. All right, now, uh, if you do a match demo, uh, so think about this, you take a match and you light it, what is a cell striking match made of? Well, you have the, 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 the chemical tip is just the start of it, but the rest of it is really just you know, paper. And so it's reacting with the oxygen around it, and so what's happening is you are breaking the bonds to begin with, and then uh, when the new products form, when the carbon and the, and the, and the carbon dioxide form, and then you get uh, then you get a release of the energy, and that's what creates the fire. Okay, and the way we describe these chemical reactions are with chemical equations. Now, these are abbreviated statements for what take place in a chemical reaction. We start writing them with word equations. This is the first step to understanding them. These use the names of the substances in equation form. So the first symbol, and we use some symbols with these, the first symbol we're going to use is the plus sign, and it is used to separate reactant from reactant and product from product. And <coughs> when we, uh, so what this really, this plus sign really means is um, it means, quote, reacts with, or it means, you know, and. Okay, so when you're reading something, it reacts with, or it ands, or, or, or something like that. The, it's, it's used to connect, um, to connect compounds that have, uh, that are on the same side of the equation, that are either on the starting side or on the finishing side. Okay, then we have the arrow, and the arrow is used to separate our reactions from our products. Okay, the arrow means yields or produces, but really it is just the chemistry equivalent. It is the chem equivalent to equals. 
is the arrow. You can't use equals in chemistry, but it is the chemistry equivalent to equals. Okay, in our example here, aluminum plus oxygen would make aluminum oxide. This would be our word equation, where aluminum and oxygen yields aluminum oxide. Okay, then after word equations, we have formula equations, and these are just like word equations, except they use the formulas of reactants and products instead of their names. So to you, keeping with the same equation, this one would be aluminum plus oxygen yielding aluminum oxide. Okay, and those, those are the formulas for those, uh, for these compounds. Okay, now, once we've established our formula equations, we get into balancing chemical equations. Now, we, we balance chemical equations in order to obey the law of conservation of matter. And according to the law of conservation of matter, atoms are not created or destroyed okay, in a chemical reaction. So the overall numbers of each kind of atom does not change from reactant to product. Whatever, whatever uh, atoms you have to begin with, they have to be there when you finish. It's just the way it works. Okay, and to start with the balancing, to start balancing the chemical equations, we need to write our skeleton equation or our formula equations. These two things are pretty much the same thing. Okay, now our skeleton equation. They're the formula equations, and they don't show the ratios of reactants to products. Okay, however, and moving on to the next page, once we start throwing coefficients in there, okay, these are what do show the whole number ratio for ratios for how our chemical reactions proceed and our, of our products and reactants. Okay, now, sort of a non sequitur here, in chemical reactions, you will see the use of catalysts. Now, these are substances that speed up chemical reactions, but they're not used in the reaction. And so, for example, manganese dioxide is used to, to decompose hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. But the manganese dioxide doesn't get used in that reaction, and so it doesn't, uh, and so it doesn't really come into the balanced equation. Now, catalysts speed up reactions by providing an alternative path to the reaction, which generally speed things up. And an example that you guys may be familiar with are enzymes. Like, you have an enzyme in your mouth called amylase. And amylase is a uh, starch-digesting enzyme. And so if you were ever to eat, uh, if you chew on a piece of bread for a long time, or chew on a cracker and just mash it around in your mouth for a long time. It'll get sweet. And the sweetness uh, is the result of the amylase breaking down the sugars that are already in the starch of whatever you just ate, and you start tasting those sugars. Now, there are some steps that we, have that we need to follow when we are balancing our equations. And the first one, uh, if we're just starting from scratch, if, we, if, if we're trying to communicate what we are doing with our uh, communicate what we are doing with our uh, with our reaction okay we write a word equation to begin with then once we have the word equation we write the formula equation sort of like what we did with the aluminum and the aluminum oxygen making aluminum oxide once we have our formula equation the chemical formulas are locked in you don't change them you don't change you know, subscripts or anything like that, what you're going to do is you're going to balance the metals using uh, the coefficients. And all of this part, all of these next few parts, are in relation to the subscripts. No, I'm sorry, not the subscripts. Oh my goodness. No, 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 no. Not the subscripts in relation to the coefficients. Coefficients. 
All right, so we're going to balance the metals. We do metals first, and then we move on to the non-metals and polyatomic ions, particularly if we have uh, polyatomic ions involved. They tend to stay together. Then we move on to hydrogens and oxygens, and we keep these f for last because hydrogens and oxygens will frequently, uh, in reactions, they, will s uh, they won't they will limit themselves to one compound. They will distribute themselves among multiple compounds uh, in a chemical reaction, and they're, they're usually the hardest to have in the balance. Okay. And then finally... Once we've balanced everything, we make sure that our coefficients are simplified into their lowest whole number ratios. So, we're going to start practice here. Okay, And calcium, we're going to start with calcium, reacts with oxygen to form calcium oxide. Now, I'm going to expand this a little bit to make it easier for you guys to see what I'm writing here. And voila! there. It's much bigger now, and so it'll be easier for me to write and easier for you to see. So, calcium reacts with oxygen to form calcium oxide. So this will be calcium reacts with oxygen, so this is the word equation, to form calcium oxide. Calcium is a, when it forms, calcium is a plus two, oxide is a minus two, and so when they form, they'll make calcium CaO. Alright, now, we then go to the form... Oh, I'm sorry, that was... I totally jumped the gun on that. They would make calcium... Oxide. Now, we start writing the formulas. So, calcium is a metal, it's by itself. And if it's just by itself, it's just going to be Ca. Okay, oxygen however, is one of our diatomic molecules. So it is going to be O2. And then when they combine, they're going to make calcium oxide. Well, calcium has a plus 2 charge. It's an alkaline earth metal with a plus 2 charge. Oxide is the ion for oxygen. It has a minus 2 charge because it's in group 6. It needs to gain 2 electrons to look like the noble gas. And so when these form, this is going to form Ca... Oh. Well, you may notice that we don't have the same number of atoms on both, side of the, uh, both sides of the arrow, so this is what we do our balance for. We start with our metals, and we notice that, oh, well, there's one calcium here, and there's one calcium here, so those are already balanced, and we don't have to do anything with that. Oxygen, however, is not balanced. We have two oxygens here and one oxygen here. So what we are going to do is we need to put a 2 there to make this oxygen balance with that oxygen. So we start a new line. Calcium plus O2 makes 2 calcium oxide. Thing is, though, here's two oxygens, here's two oxygens, but now we also have two calciums because this coefficient counts for the entire compound over here. So if we have two calciums here, we're going to need to add another calcium over here here. And that winds up balancing our equation. So now we're going to have 2 calcium plus 1 O2 is going to yield 2 calcium oxides. And we didn't need an E here. Okay. Next one, we have sodium phosphate reacts with iron 2 chloride Kind of tough to see. Hold on. Sorry, part of that was off the screen, and so I needed to center that for you all. Okay, sodium phosphate reacts with iron 2 chloride to produce sodium chloride and iron 2 phosphate. This is going to be difficult for me to draw in here, so I'm going to, I'm going to write really small. Sodium phosphate. and iron 2 chloride produce sodium chloride
and iron 2 phosphate. Okay, so sodium phosphate, we now need to write our formula equation. So that's going to be, whoa, that was big. Sodium phosphate is going to be Na3PO4. Iron 2 chlorate, chloride, is going to be FeCl2. That's because the iron is going to have a plus 2 charge. Chloride will have a minus 1, so we need two chlorides with the iron. Phosphate is a PO4 minus. A PO4, 3 minus. Sodium is a plus 1, so you need three sodiums to balance with that. Uh, sodium is a plus 1. Chloride is a minus 1, so that's just going to be NaCl. And iron, 2, and phosphate, this is a plus 2. That's a minus 3, so this one's complicated. This one is Fe3 parentheses, P, O, 4, 2. Now we get to balance, and the first thing we do is we look at the metals. Sodium, there's three here, there's one here, and we're going to put a three in front of that sodium. Then we look at the other metal. There's iron, and there's three irons there, so we're going to need a three in front of that iron as well. Okay, then we go to the next step. So this will be in a 3 po 4 plus 3 FeCl2 makes 3 NaCl plus Fe3 PO4 2. Now, we go to the nonmetals and polyatomic ions. There's one PO4 over here. There are two PO4s over here. So that means we're going to need to put a 2 out in front of this guy out here. Well, that's sort of a problem, because now all of a sudden, we're also changing our numbers of sodiums. This sodium can no longer be 3. We've doubled this molecule, so we're going to need twice as many of that, which turns this into a 6. Now, then because there's 3 sodiums, I'm sorry, 6 sodiums and 2 phosphates, here we have three irons and six chlorines. Here we have six sodiums and six chlorines. Here we have three irons and two phosphates, and there you have it. It is a balanced chemical equation, and again, we didn't need this one here either. All right, we have symbols that go with these chemical equations. And these symbols, okay, these symbols are referred to, um, it, we have these S's and we'll have L's and G's. And S, L, and G, we did have somebody guess that was liquid, I'm sorry, it was a liter, gram, and second as uh, for the metric base units. But no, they stand for solid, liquid, and gas. We also have a situation if we have certain salts that are, or certain things that are dissolved in water, those are called an aqueous solution, and we'll often have a number of salts that are, salts that are dissolved in water. Uh, after aqueous solution, sometimes we'll have reactions that have result in a precipitate, which is a solid that drops out of a uh, a solid that drops out of a out of aqueous solutions. Okay, sometimes in those solutions we have a gas that gets produced. And in all of them, there is some sort of heat that is being absorbed or released. Now, an example using these symbols is we have two aluminum, two moles of aluminum, and aluminum is a solid, with six moles of hydrochloric acid, which is an aqueous solution of that, will yield two moles of aluminum chloride in aqueous solution. It will create three moles of hydrogen gas, and it will make 86 kilojoules, and that will be released. Now, as this is, this 86 kilojoules is on the reactant side, of, I'm sorry, the product side over here. It's as if this is produced in the reaction, and if it is produced in the reaction, 
okay, it would be an exothermic situation. If this 86 joules, 86 kilojoules were on this side of the reaction, they would be absorbed as if they were a reactant that they had to go into the reaction in order to make it go. And it would be an endothermic. Now, some uh, some chemistry books don't like uh, putting the 86 kilojoules on this side. So another, and so what they will do is to show that it is end. If something is endothermic, for example, they would do you know two aluminum solid plus six HCl. Now, if this were an endothermic, if this were exothermic, they would do a uh. I'm sorry, they would put nothing here. But over here, if this were an endothermic, then they would make this a negative 86 kilojoules on this side of the equation. If this was negative, that would mean it is endothermic. Okay, I know this is kind of confusing, but try if you see this energy term, Set it up in your head so where, where it has a positive sign next to it, and that'll help you determine whether something is endothermic and exothermic. Okay, well, that was our first lecture for this chapter, and we'll pause right there, and we'll set up for 11.2, uh, and I'll see you guys next time.